Hello, Dr. Cecil Kaninendijk van den Bosch is head of the Department of Landscape Architecture, Planning and Management at the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences. He is also part-time professor of green space management at the University of Copenhagen. He has long been a proponent of urban forests and, and is addressing that topic in a keynote speech here at the 24th EUFRO World Forest Congress in Salt Lake City, Utah. Dr. Kanenendijk van den Bosch joins us now to talk a bit about the Congress and his speech. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Now, I've sort of hit a little bit about your urban forest uh, addiction. Mm. Do you want to expand on that a little bit? How did, how did you get interested in that in the first place? It's a very good, uh, good question. Uh, like many other kids, I guess, who were in the forest quite often with their parents, I got interested in trees and ecology, etc. So that was my, my entry into the forestry field. Uh, but then I realized there was something missing in, in that uh, relation. So I got interested really in the people I mentioned as well, where to do that better than in the city. Oh, good. Okay, now I'm assuming that your keynote speech that you will be giving, we're doing this on a Friday and the keynote will be tomorrow, uh, will be about urban forestry. It will be, yes. What will the key points in that be? For me, a very important point is this issue of happiness and how we create happy cities for, for the world's population. Soon most of us will live in cities, or already do. So I think this creation of happiness is very much related to trees and nature in the city as well. G give me an example. How do trees create happiness? Just by viewing trees, we know that, for example, our stress levels drop in the city. Um, parks and other nature areas are wonderful areas for us to play, to meet people, to create social cohesion, etc. And this all contributes to our, our very happiness and well-being. Should we care about urban forests? Yes, we should. And, and not just because it's nice, but it's because it's necessary, it's needed. We need to have urban forests for sustainable cities, for cities where we ac actually can be healthy and well in uh, and happy in. And so it's, it's not really about uh, creating nice cities, but it's really about those economic benefits as well, and, and the psychological benefits, and not in the least also the environmental services provided by urban forests. Okay, what, you've been in this field, in this particular area for a while. Have you seen changes in the way that urban forests are viewed and managed and, and utilized by people? Yes, I think one thing is that there's much more awareness of the benefits and the need to, the need to economi economize, marketize the benefits, so put a value on them. I think also the way we look at urban forests and how we manage them has changed in the way that we integrate more. We look more from the single tree all the way to the prairie urban woodland as well. So there have been some shifts, I think, and urban forestry in general has become a more established field, I would say. And I suppose this just occurred to me that as, as the population gets more and more urbanized, that it tends to get divorced from the forest, the natural forest. So having an urban forest at least brings back some of that connection. I would say so, definitely. On the one hand, it relieves some of the pressure on, on the natural forest, and on the yes. other hand, it establishes this connection, for sure. Yeah. What's the biggest threat or challenge that faces urban forests right now? I think it is the whole urban development threat and, of course, the fact that in, a, in an urban area there's a lot of political interest, a lot of economic interest, where urban forestry is often still seen as a kind of a soft sector. So uh, that we really have to fight how do you How do you face that down? How do you confront that? I think it's about, on the one hand, uh, putting the benefits clear to politicians and to the public and also to create alliances, so to, to create support for urban forestry broadly shared among the population and local community. You've been involved with the UFRO for quite a few years. I Has have, that yeah. been a beneficial relationship? Very much so. I entered UFRO as a, as a young student and, and got into urban forestry, got into the, the, the networking in our UFRO, and it has helped me tremendously to establish an international career as well, We're having worked now in five different countries, uh, working with urban forestry. Now, you've been here for the week, going through the various sessions. Has any one session stuck out in your mind? I would say the plenary we had on Thursday, together with the Society of American Foresters and the Canadian Forest Institute, where there was focus on, on the larger scale, uh, GIS mapping, etc., on the worldwide scale, as well as one square meter of forest and how to study that, and that connection between the two that may be counterintuitive counter but actually exists, that really inspired me uh, about the wonderful complexity of our field. And what about your own career? Is there one achievement for you that stands out there too? I think my colleagues and, I, and, I, and, and me, we have really been managing to establish urban forestry as a scientific field. But one specific thing I would like to mention is that we set up a journal 12 years ago, Urban Forestry and Urban Greening, has become well established, publishes very good papers, got an impact factor, and really has become a, a good medium for urban forest science. I see. And where do you go from here? After this Congress ends, you'll be back doing your work. What, where, was that, where will that take you? 
I think it's very much about, uh, on the one hand, governance issues. So how do we decide on urban forest and how do we bring in different stakeholders or shareholders, as somebody has said this week. But also I think about bridging between disciplines. I work a lot with landscape architects and landscape planners and, and they really have a very big role to play as well. To bring in foresters in a mix of disciplines dealing with our urban trees and urban woodlands. That seems to be a fairly common theme that, that forests forest studies have to get broader. They have to start looking at other things. Absolutely. You would agree with that, I think? I would very much agree with that. And the sneak preview at the, the final statement from this conference will, will show that the word landscape will feature quite strongly in that. It and is. I could not be a bigger proponent of that, a fan of that. I think it's very good, yeah. And finally, I was going to say that your name, Vandenbosch, is very handy to have since it means from the forest. Now you have to figure out a way, I guess you have to talk to your mum to get this. Exactly. Figure out a way to get from the urban forest. That would be just perfect. Or perhaps but, uh, to the urban forest. To the urban forest, I think <laughs> that would be the best way to do it. Yeah. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks very much, thank you. Okay. Yeah. I'd like to ask you to welcome Professor Cecil Konindajik van den Bosch. The floor is yours. Thank you, Tuya. Thanks, Tuya, for this very nice and, and warm introduction. And uh, wow, it's quite, uh, quite something to come up here and be keynote speaker at IUFRO. In my first IUFRO conference in 1995, I had this kind of dream that one day I could actually stand up here and, and address the whole audience. And, uh, now I'm, I'm here, and I guess one dream was fulfilled. And a big thanks for the organ to the organizers for inviting me and giving me this very big responsibility of being keynote speaker. A special thanks I would like to extend to uh, outgoing UFRO president, Niels Elis Koch, who has been my mentor over the last decades. And uh, a big thanks, Niels, for making me stand up here now. Let's see how things develop. All right, what I would like to talk to you to, to, about, uh, to, about uh, today is, is the whole um, connection between city and forests. And as we know, most of the world's population today lives in cities. So this also means that many people's interaction with forests is very much based on our interaction with uh, forests in or near cities. And to think about that topic in a city like Salt Lake is actually uh, interesting. Salt Lake, as, as many of you may know, was founded in 1847 by a group of, of Mormons who came here in a, in a rather harsh climate. There were hardly any trees. So what happened is that they started irrigating, they started vegetating, they started planting trees. So from an area where there was no forest, actually a forest city was created with trees in the city center as well as wonderful watershed forests that some of us visited during the excursions on, um, on Wednesday, on Tuesday, Wednesday. Yeah. So an impressive story, I think, of how forest city, a forest city can be developed. And it also shows, I would say, that this relationship between forest and city doesn't have to be such a negative one. And I think when we think about forest and cities, we often think about cities eating away on the forest, trying to destroy the forest to build asphalt, concrete, etc. So this image of the city as a kind of a destructive force where people start living together under quite harsh circumstances, where we are maybe not individuals anymore, but become part of this great machine called the urban. A quite negative view, of course, of the city. If we look at cities like Toronto here, we see a tremendous sprawl. Maybe the issue of identity comes in here. Do we really feel connected to these places? An urban area may be different, but suburban areas in Toronto, Melbourne, or, or Central Europe, they could be very much similar looking. And one can really start wondering, are we doing the right thing with our cities? We see that this urbanization process is ongoing, uh, not in the least in the developing part of the world, where, for example, Africa is slow, slowly but steadily now becoming an urban continent. And within the next few decades, everywhere in the world, the majority of the population will live in cities. Some prognoses say that by 2015, 50, we're talking about 70 to 80% of the world's population living in urban areas. And that's a dramatic shift from actually 80% of us living in rural areas less than 100 years ago. Maps like this show actually that land use is heavily affected by this. This shows a map of Europe and the darker area shows the highest transition from natural land to urban land. 
So our land use is changing as well with urbanization and sprawl. And this has several consequences. You can see on the map here that uh, one of the issues that is happening is that we are not as mobile. We often start having lifestyles that are less healthy for us. So one of the consequences from a public health perspective is that obesity is on the rise. By and all, you can say in all parts of the world. And that is an issue that is affecting us, not only in terms of our health, but also in terms of public health expenses. So is it all dark and negative then, or is there actually something positive to be said? And of course there is, otherwise I wouldn't be standing here. There is a long tradition of cities and towns all over the world connecting to their natural heritage, embracing their forests, embracing their trees, conserving them for the benefit of the population. And if there are no forests and trees, like in the case of Salt Lake City, planting trees, bringing the forest into the city. This little map of the Dutch town of Haarlem shows a very important resource for this town, the Haarlem Hout Forest, just outside of the city walls, that was vigorously protected by the city during times of wars, for example, with the Spanish, and actually survives until today. So in many cases, we brought trees into the city, like here in Copenhagen, creating a forest in the city. The same here on, in the town of um, Castries in Santa Lucia, bringing trees in, combining the natural environment with the city environment, creating a green network. And in other cases, like in our wonderful Scandinavian cities, we could actually use the existing forest and bring the city into it, creating true forest cities, cities in the forest. Now, during the past 40 or 50 years, scientists in IUFRO and other organizations have been working with trees and forests in and around cities. And we have often done this under this concept of urban forestry, which is a concept that doesn't look only at the forest ecosystem, but looks at the whole city and the trees within it as one big urban forest ecosystem, taking an integrated perspective from the single tree to the peri-urban woodland, taking a strategic view on developing trees and forests, being highly inter, or at least multidisciplinary, combining forestry, landscape architecture, social sciences, psychology, economy, branding, etc. It's also highly participatory, working with local communities to develop urban forest resources and urban forest benefits. And of course, it's also highly urban, which means that we have to adapt some of the methods, some of the approaches that we have in forestry, in arboriculture, and other fields, and actually bring them into an urban context. We have to think in innovative ways of how we deal with forest and trees. What I would like to do today is actually to, to bring as kind of a model or a frame for how we develop those city-forest relationships. And I would like to do that based on some work done in the past by people like Richard Florida and Joel Kotkin and Timothy Beatley, who very much try to analyze, well, what makes cities good? What makes cities competitive? What makes cities healthy and livable places? What makes cities attract talent and people in general to live there? And there are some factors, like Florida talks about talent and tolerance and technology. And Joa Kotkin speaks of cities that need to be safe, sacred, as well as busy. And Timothy Beatley, of course, very much talks in terms of green urbanism, rethinking our way of developing cities. So I use that, but I also go back then to something very basic in a way, Maslow's hierarchy of, of human needs. I mean, of course, cities across the world have very different circumstances. In some cases, we're talking about creating livelihoods the physiological needs, the safety needs that we need to provide our citizens. And from there on, we can actually create a culture of community and belonging, rising up to hiring esteem, and then ultimately also coming up to the level of self-actualization, of creativity, of people becoming very good members of the community and very good problem solvers, a kind of an ultimate state that we would like to see achieved. So I will talk about nine characteristics of the sylvan urban liaison over time. I will talk about the issue of opportunity, creating livelihoods. I will talk about the need for diversity, resiliency, which is very much connected to this, safety, literacy, or actually more general learning, liberty, people engaging in dem democratic processes and claiming the city, claiming the right to the city. Very important is the, the, the liaison of community, of building connections between people and place and between people and people. 
And from there on, we can actually get into those characteristics of happiness created from well-being as well as creativity and problem-solving capacity. I would argue, ladies and gentlemen, that we as urban foresters and as foresters, we are in the business of creating happiness. And that is actually a very, very good goal to have. So opportunity, this is very much about livelihoods. And of course, people move to cities in order to find livelihoods. Be it in Sao Paulo, where people create their own informal settlements near to the, the business district, or be it here again in Saint Lucia, where people trade and try to create lives for themselves. Where cities, of course, create opportunity, much more, baby, than rural areas could do for them. And their forest, the forest here comes in as well. This is the town of Ras Ha'ain in Israel. Where on the one hand, there's the Jewish town, on the other hand, is the Arabic town. And when I visited there, I could see very different ways of using the local urban forest. While it was a recreation area for the people from the, the Jewish town, the people from the Arabic town came there to find, for example, medicinal plants and graze their animals. So urban forest can be an element of different kinds of communities and different kinds of needs and help actually to provide livelihoods, even in industrialized nations. And this is something that we see more and more. We see also in the West that we are talking about food forest. We're talking about bioenergy coming from urban forest. We're talking about some direct connection between the local forest and trees and local society, helping to provide livelihoods. Albeit not maybe from a forest perspective, but urban agriculture is, is tremendously important today everywhere in the world, providing direct food resources and healthy foods in food deserts, for example, in Brooklyn, New York, as here. So the green element, I would argue, is becoming more and more important. And from a livelihood, from an opportunity perspective, there's very strong connections here between biodiversity conserved, biodiversity developed, and our human health and well-being. And that brings me to the topic of diversity. Today's society holds up a lot of values, and I think one of the values that we really should cherish is that of diversity. Diversity in the people, in the cultures, Diversity also in the ecosystem that we are living in. Diversity in the way we think, diversity in the way we learn, diversity in how we build community. There is no such thing as a one-fits-all approach. And many cities, many successful cities around the world, they realize that diversity is the key thing they have to establish in order to be successful. One city that has gotten this is the city of Vancouver, Canada. In Vancouver, 52% of the population speaks another language than English as its first, first language. And Vancouver consistently ranks among the top five cities on city competitive scales. And other cities out there like Melbourne and Zurich and Copenhagen, they have very similar kind of approaches. They want diversity, but what they also want is a green city. They want to cherish the green heritage, both the existing natural landscape as well as the created urban forest. Now we know from research that biodiversity and tree diversity is important for creating ecosystem services, for guaranteeing a range of environmental as well as cultural services that are crucial to our cities. So maybe this is not the kind of urban forest to be created. Single species, single age, not at all resilient, of course. But then, on the other hand, this is the same here. This is Stockholm, Sweden. Single species, single age, not very tolerant to threats, but of course highly aesthetic and highly important from a cultural perspective. So it is a complex issue, this of diversity. And we know that in many cities around the world, five or even less tree species make up two-thirds of the tree population in the city. And that, of course, is highly problematic when we start thinking about resiliency and creating, establishing ecosystem services. So we need more tree diversity. And this issue has come up during recent years as really an important part of the urban forestry agenda. Diversity is also reflected in the way our urban forests look. This is a little study we did in Denmark that shows that a lot of the urban woodland resources that we have in Danish cities are actually very small scale. They may be between zero and a few hectares. Well, of course, in other cases, there could be larger peri-urban woodland areas of maybe several thousands of hectares that are also urban forests. So very complex resource, also in terms of, of its ownership. And maybe, the urban forest extends all the way here to this very local urban forest in Toronto. So urban forest is very diverse, and we, coming with our, with our forestry glasses, 
we will have to readjust here and not think, of course, about the usual forest ecosystem approaches that we uh, apply. Very interesting term here, I think, that connects this human diversity and natural diversity is the concept of biocultural diversity. We've heard it discussed here at the conference as well. And it really is, I think, a very innovative pr approach of combining these two dimensions and not isolating biodiversity from human diversity. And like happened, what happened with the Brundtland report way back that connected economy and natural cons nature conservation, I think it's time for us to actually connect biodiversity and cultural diversity. In this way, we can create much more meaningful ways of dealing with biodiversity as well as cultural diversity. That brings me to the issue of resiliency. And I mean, if there's one type of human area, land use, that is resilient, it's our cities. And resiliency can be very simply defined as the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties and toughness. I mean, we human beings, we're very resilient in most cases. We face our challenges here and there, and we also often bounce back and actually find our way through it. Well, maybe some cases you would say that resiliency wouldn't help. This is Hiroshima, Japan, when the American bombs were dropped on it. But re Hiroshima recovered, came back, created a wonderful city that actually cherishes world peace, cherishes a green heritage, and is a kind of an ultimate example of how resilient our cities are. London in the Second World War was under heavy bombing from the Germans and something was created called Victory Gardens. People were encouraged to use all available land to grow their own vegetables. And these Victory Gardens, of course, have a very different purpose today in terms of urban agriculture, but show again this kind of resiliency of the urban system. People are actually able, within the frames they have, within the limited conditions they have, to create natural resiliency as well. Another little example is from the Alkmaar de Hout, the forest in my home country of the Netherlands, where the German army cut the entire urban forest in order to make a, a launching base for its V2 rockets that were launched towards England. Completely cut, all the beech trees in this wonderful little urban forest were cut. The first thing the population of Alkmaar did after the war, replant the forest. It was a crucial thing for them. It went back with them in their history for 400 years and they would not give it up just because it was destroyed once again. Another very tragic example is that of the town of Sarajevo in Bosnia-Herzegovina that during the war was completely, um, we can say completely um, taken, all the trees were completely taken away from it. There were 75% of all the urban trees were, were disappeared and primarily it was because of fuel wood harvesting by the local population. But also here, planting has gone on after the end of the Balkan Wars, and also here, resiliency has prevailed. Oops. So how do we do with resiliency then today, my dear colleagues, dear urban foresters, when all these lovely little critters here are making our life very difficult? Emerald ash borer, Asian longhorn beetle, Dutch elm disease, etc., etc. We are challenged more than ever by all these pests and diseases that are really pushing our diversity and resilience to the limit. So we need innovative approaches. We need to think about the resources we have. We need to be very aware about tree diversity. We need to be very aware about the functionality of urban forest and way to improve its resiliency. And initiatives and programs like the US Forest Service iTree program that actually helps us assess our urban forest resource and its functionality will be crucial also in the future. When people live in cities, they would want, of course, cities to be safe. They want to be able to walk on the streets at night, and most importantly, they want their children to be able to walk on the streets at night and play in the local parks. So people start looking, when they start moving to places, they start in investigating, how safe is my city? They look at crime maps. Maybe the dark areas here in Washington DC should be avoided. And here comes also the forest into the picture. Because funny enough, of course, we've had this very dual, very contradictory relationship when it comes to our forest, also our local forest. On the one hand, we needed it. We needed it for all its products and, and services. On the other hand, it was a bit of a dangerous environment, dark and unknown. It was difficult for us to orientate ourselves. We're not very good at night, of course, as human beings. So a lot of our fairy tales and, and, and stories evolve around this kind of love-hate relationship with the forest, like Little Red Riding Hood here. And interesting enough, also today in urban forestry, we're fighting that kind of primeval fear of the forest that we still find with large parts of our population. How do we get people into our forest? 
how do we get people to use the forest and to connect to it and make it part of their community? This could be the case, of course, for people living in cities today, but especially also for newcomers, people who come from different cultures and that maybe not have this natural connection to the local forest. That brings me to the issue of literacy. And this is my dad, who has been a teacher for his whole life. He retired a few years ago, and he's sitting here with his two cousins, Roman and Perrin. And he tries to tell them a bit about maps here, I guess, and uh, tries to teach them a bit to read, etc. Roman and Perrin are great readers, but what they're better at is actually playing iPad. Whenever I see them, whenever I see a photo of them, I see them with an iPad in their hand. I heard a story from a friend in the US who said he had his two-year-old cousin visiting him, and he gave the, the little cousin a nice magazine with animal pictures in it. And all of a sudden, he saw this cousin of his making this movement on the pictures, <laughs> trying to enlarge them, of course, as one does with an iPad. So that is the kind of society we're at today, highly techno technologized, and highly, of course, people like Roman and Perrin, kids like Roman and Perrin, they have to be really encouraged to go out and play in nature. And authors like Richard Louvre, they have realized this and say, hey, actually, we have to step up here. We have to really be careful because we're losing this connection between our children and their natural environments. Think back for yourself, those of us who are older than 40, think back how you spend your time as a child. We were out in nature, playing football, enjoying the local forest or woods. When I ask children today what they are doing, a lot of the time they spend it inside. Computers, iPads, smartphones although they can take them outside. In some way, that's the way to connect them, actually. So we have to be aware of what, what Louvre called the nature deficit disorder. And urban forests here play an important role, of course, as play environments, where, where kids can go out and really enjoy, but also as learning environments, like we do at SLU in Alnarp and in, uh, in other areas in Sweden, creating so-called landscape laboratories, real-scale test areas, where we combine different kind of woodland management approaches and landscape approaches and test them also for urban areas. Liberty, then, as the next liaison. Cities, of course, are the real center of liberty, of freedom. Citizens, those people living in cities, were the first who got rights to be free, not to be slaves. When they were actually recognized as citizens, they, came, they became, got the rights to, for example, get involved in political decision making. And that we know, of course, today, um, countries all over the world, this is Tahrir Square in, in Cairo, where the city becomes a playground or becomes a manifestation ground of democracy. Freedom can have many different faces. This is Anne Frank, probably the most famous Dutch person over time and for very tragic reasons. Anne Frank was hiding away from the Germans during the Second World War in her Achterhuis hiding place. As he had no connection, she was not allowed to go out. So she wrote about life and she was very much relying on her inner life that she had one important connection, and that was her horse chestnut tree that was standing outside. And it was very clear from the very few entries in her diary that this tree for her was a, a form of liberty. It was her connection to the, to the world, and she could let her thoughts go to the bigger forest and the bigger nature outside. A tree at your doorstep, a forest in your mind. And talking about war and forest and trees, the city of Berlin, of course, after the Second World War, got cut off from its forest resources and was very heavily reliable, relying on forests like the Grunewald, where people could go in the weekend and have a feeling that at least their city was a bit bigger than it actually was and that there was no wall around it. Nature and liberty. But of course we run into issues here of private property and uh, areas that were fenced off and were not available for urban populations. Jägersborg Deer Park in, uh, near, near Copenhagen was fenced off by the Danish king for a long, long time to be his private hunting ground and he even removed a few of the villages in it because you don't want, of course, any obstructions when you do your private hunting uh, activities. But this park, of course, was opened later and became an important part of the finger plan and the green infrastructure of Copenhagen. And these issues about property and tenure and about who actually has right to the urban forest are very much discussed today in the literature. For example, in this wonderful new book, authored by colleagues in Canada on the political ecology of urban forestry. And then there's the issue of wilderness. Wilderness, of course, is also connected to freedom, not in the least here in the United States. The frontier, the feeling that we can actually explore something that one hasn't explored before. City forests like here in Mumbai have this wilderness touch to it and can still bring in the wild also in our cities and towns. 
That brings me to community, one of the most important liaisons. And of course, we flock to cities. We flock to cities to be with communities. And we have difficulties building communities in cities because we, we meet with people that are actually different than us, maybe. And if we don't want to be with only the people that are like us, then we are challenged in building communities. But when one goes to cities in, for example, Spain here, one sees communities actually emerging and sees how connections and ties are actually existing, centered often around public spaces and, and trees. And this little anecdote actually illustrates that very much. There's another example from the Netherlands, a forest called the Haagse Bos, the Hague Forest, which in the 16th century was already a very well-respected and very much loved forest for the city of the Hague, Haag. But then William of Orange, our first ruler in the Netherlands, he decided that he needed to cut the forest because he had to fight the Spanish armies and he had no money for it, so he needed money to pay his soldiers. So the, citizen of the ha citizens of the Hague's the Hague got really upset and said, we have to stop this, we need to conserve our forest. And this is a time when people were extremely religious in the Netherlands, but still what they did is they melted all the church bells in the Hague, and from the, the revenue they got from the church bells, they paid off William. And in return, William signed something which is called the Act of Redemption that says, from now on, and this is 1576, from now on and ever in the future, the city of the Hague will have its own forest, the Haagsebos. So urban forestry, has a very long heritage. And how we build communities can be very much related to the communities of our forests. Places where we build ties and we are together with our fellow citizens. So when we create new green spaces, much appreciated and high profile, like in the High Line in New York, we also have to build communities around it. We have to connect people in place because it's not enough to design. One also has to establish those relations. That brings me to my two final liaisons, and the first one is happiness. And as I said, I think we are in a business, especially in urban forestry, of creating happiness. An interesting book by Charles Montgomery from Canada actually goes into that and says, well, we have to design happy cities. We have to think about cities where people generally feel happy, realizing, of course, that we do feel miserable every once in a while. That's okay, but uh, in general, we have to be happy. So how do we retrofit our cities for happiness? And he talks very much about, for example, landscaping and trees and densification and creating quality. Happiness, spirituality, like here in Sri Lanka. Local trees that actually connect people, religion, and their own personal life, and not in the least also their community. Or initiatives like here, uh, Jill Penalosa's organization, 880 Cities. Jill Penalosa was the former parks director in Bogota, Colombia. And when he stopped there, he, he decided to set up this organization promoting good public spaces, good parks, and good soft traffic mobility around the world. And he says, if we can create cities that are good for eight-year-olds and good for 80-year-olds, they will be good for any city. An interesting approach. Would you send your eight-year-old off on the streets of Salt Lake City? Or how about your, your father of 80? Would you send him off? Or would you rather have the city to actually develop itself in a better direction? Happiness urban forest and happiness. We see it in the joy of the children who use urban forest and parks. We feel it in ourselves when we have had a stress day and go out to the park and forest and realize that actually we feel better after a few minutes. Science shows it, heart rates drop, adrenaline levels drop. We feel better, we restore ourselves. And we can do it right where we live. And if we get to that situation, and I know that creativity often is based on miserably, being, feeling miserable, of course. A lot of the good writers and so, they were really suffering. Suffering and trying to be creative. But I would argue a good creativity actually can also be based on well-being. And that is the kind of approach that my student, Trine Plumbeck in Copenhagen took a while ago when she said, I want to look into the life, into the minds of some of the creative professionals in Denmark, writers, actors, sculptures. And I want to ask them, what is the role of nature, of the local forest, in your creative process? So she showed them pictures, and she interviewed them about their creative process and what nature meant for it. And all of those people said, nature is crucial for us, especially during the first phase of our creative process, when we have to be inspired, we have to deconnect, we have to get rid of the stress. We go out to our local forest, we go out to the sea, we go out to our local park, or we just go into the garden, and we conceptualize, we form ideas, we become creative. 
So some of these keywords I've had the pleasure, these liaisons I've had the pleasure to work with, and these are four of my own PhD students I've been supervising over the last years, where Akmar from Malaysia has been looking very much at issues of diversity, of how different populations in Malaysia use the local parks. Where Sri from, Mal from Malaysia has been looking at safety issues and the, the designing vegetation in parks that, are, that people feel safe in. Where Sylvia from Croatia has been looking at issues of liberty and governance in the town of Zagreb and how urban forests are planned for and managed. And Johnson from Hong Kong has been looking at the issue of community and branding cities, green cities, for example Hong Kong, using green spaces to create community and city profile. Before I end my talk, I would like to stress one thing, and that is again coming back to sustainable urban develop the sustainable development goals that we have heard talk about before here in the conference. And we've heard that forests feature in at least two of the objectives. I can add a third one. Under the goal number 11, which says making cities and human settlements inclusive, safe and resilient and sustainable, there's a specific target about creating open and green spaces for everybody within reach proximity of especially young and elderly people in our societies. So there's a big task ahead of us. Urban foresters, foresters, landscape architects, social scientists, urban planners, psychologists, creative professionals, to develop our cities, not only as forest in the cities, but also as city forest. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much for your excellent talk. You really enlightened us with all the great knowledge and your understanding of what forest is about for urban people and how forests are an important co component of the urban environment. Well, um, now it's time to open the, uh, to the, uh, for the questions and answers. You, you have two microphones over there on the main aisles. Please use them. And uh, we take one, questions one at a time. And please keep your questions short. Tell your name and your affiliation. And I will be pointing out your turns. I can see that you from President <laughs> Ms. Koch is Hi, greetings from the snow here in Canada, Ontario. I hope you enjoyed my lecture. Nice to see you all, and I'm really happy that one of my former PhD students, Dr. Norak Mar, is now teaching urban forestry at UPM. I wish you all well in your career. Think about the benefits trees provide to us and the best ways to design, plan, and manage urban forests. Um, I'm sure this is needed just as much in Malaysia as it is in, here in Canada. Thanks again, and good luck with your studies.